So um, what I want to talk about today is migrating non-mods XML data into Island Roy 8, uh, and specifically not using, for example, solar, uh, because sometimes you want to preserve a little bit more structure. And uh, overall, the big takeaways I want you to take from this, uh, from the get-go, this is going to be a little bit of a developer-focused one, but the thing that everyone can kind of uh, take away is I want you to understand that you should model your content as you want it to show up in Drupal. And doing the easier thing for migration, because you just want to get the migration working now, can tie your hands uh, later on. So it really is worth it to, you know, there are lots of content considerations in Drupal 8 and Islander 8 are very powerful in how you can model your data. So building your data models around your migration really ties, really is kind of limiting your scope where you don't need to. Um, Drupal 8 and Islander 8 are a lot more flexible and you should take advantage of that flexibility. So uh, I want to give the story of data.upei.ca. So what that is, is an Islander 7 site that stores data sets produced by UPEI researchers, University of Prince Edward Island. Uh, it's integrated with Pidio, which is a uh, kind of a self-hosted file sharing system, kind of like a self-hosted Dropbox thing. But unfortunately, it's a little bit um, abandoned at this point, and uh, it's more or less going away. So when we decided to upgrade to our data repository to Drupal 8 and Island R8, we were going to move away from it. So, and that meant that we uh, decided to more or less bootstrap from the start and we got a grant from Canary to build a uh, modern research data management platform. Uh, in data.upei.ca, the metadata for these data sets is stored in a format called BDI, uh, specifically in the XML uh, version of that. That stands for Data Documentation Initiative and it comes out of the social sciences, mainly established as a standard for sharing surveys and other uh, data sets that uh, they often exchange with each other. Uh, it's just showing you a little bit more of what the uh, data set looks like on a uh, page on data.upei.ca. Uh, besides the DBI stream, everything else is pretty standard looking Islandora 7 data streams. Uh, and content, the data sets themselves were stored as zip files for the most part, so we didn't really pull them apart, uh, do a whole lot with them. Uh, the, the real main differentiator was storing the, the custom metadata stream, which was the thing that we had to do some work to migrate out. So DDI records, uh, there's, the important thing to note about them is some of the elements are similarly to mods, uh, some of the structured elements can't be extracted in a simple way from using solar, where, for example, the purpose of solar is to find and retrieve data based on a, a search for a string. It is not a data store. I always want to kind of repeat that to people because when people start to learn to use solar, they get real big ambitions. Um, but sometimes they use it for things it's not suited for. Specifically, it is not a NoSQL database. Um, after indexing, for example, contributor, and contributor role, which are stored together in this element here. Uh, when you index them into solar, they're just two separate floating uh, entities, which can is perfectly adequate for uh, text search, but doesn't group them in a logical way uh, when you're trying to migrate the data. So uh, each contributor, like I said, has a role attached to it. And those are things like hosting institution, data manager. And when you're modeling data, so that, let's go back to talking about modeling and what we, some of the extra considerations that don't necessarily appear in the data that you're trying to migrate from, but in Drupal 8 especially, and Island R8 give you so much more power that you can, you can really express your, the full scope of your needs and you're not just building around an existing system. You can, Without a lot of development work, uh, if you're just sort of a skilled site administrator, site builder, you can express a lot of power using Drupal. And uh, the case example that I want to use for this is how we model people. Uh, so in our case, we, we decided some things, and Rosie was the main driver for these considerations. Uh, for example, a person may have more than one ORCID ID and might want to use them in different 
uh, situations. A person may wish to enter their name in a different way from that is expressed in their ORCID. A person may have other identifiers like ISNI. For example, ISNI is described names and it has scope of a published media. For example, uh, public identities. Well, ORCIDs describe people in general and they sort of persist across publications. Uh, as well, a person may change their name and quote, if it's linked to data, that may uh, expect that it changes to be reflected across all instances. But at the same time, if it's bibliographic data, then it should be persi uh, persisted as it was entered. So uh, a little bit of a visual for how we model how simple slash complicated a person can get. So a person can be as simple as just a string for a name. Uh, but in our case, a person uh, can also contain uh, more than one identifier. And we've structured our identifiers such that they are paired with an identifier type for each one. Uh, Jonathan mentioned having kind of a typed identifier uh, emergence pattern. And we, we observed the same thing. And we, we kind of went all in with it. Uh, and we expect to do more. As well, a person can have affiliations attached to them, which is like an institution. And those institutions we model as organizations, which can also have their own sets of identifiers, which are slightly different. Uh, and all of that can be, so the names can be, uh, you can go deep, it's kind of a Russian doll of extra data that can hook off of a name uh, entity like this. Uh, but we don't store them as separate entities uh, in the Drupal sort of sense. We don't store them as separate nodes, rather. But what I want to say about how we model them is uh, we don't create person objects uh, per the previous slide. A person may have a very different set of attributes from one use to the next, from one instance of a data set to the next or a publication. So adding a new published data set with a contributor that previously existed in another data set should not update or affect the previous citation info. So a contributor is a person with a role attached to it. Uh, and we kind of model it. We model a person in a couple of places for creator and then also for contributor. And we can kind of reuse that. And we are able to reuse this while not kind of making the person an outside addressable entity by paragraphs. And I've talked about paragraphs before. I really like them. They're structured data that limits its uh, scope to the parent node. And what you should really think of when you see the name paragraphs, paragraphs is kind of the Drupal end user content creators use of them, but architecturally they are better referred to as entity reference revisions. So what that means is, and I'm realizing I'm running a little bit long, so uh, an entity reference revision, it paragraphs exist inside the scope of the parent entity. They are revision locked. That means updating info inside of a quote unquote contributor or fader person and saving reflects as an update to the parent entity, which is not true if you are kind of referencing a taxonomy term uh, externally to the node. And deleting the parent node deletes all child paragraphs. They're also easier to reference in things like twig templates. You can just treat them more, more or less like fields. Uh, the big drawback is we don't really, we didn't really pursue uh, turning these entities into RDF in Fedora, mostly because Fedora doesn't give us a adequate, uh, you know, value add for doing that right now. So uh, here's a demo of, this is gonna go, let's try again. I might actually just skip that because it appears to not be working. Oh. So here's me adding a uh, person entity as a creator. And the user interface when you have paragraphs will update itself to include the fields for the specific uh, or, uh, type that you wanted, whether it was an organization or a person, it would uh, give you different user interface elements. And those are controllable using a similar interface to when you control the fields in Drupal. And move on from that. So 
migrate, the actual migrate. Migrate import plugin. Uh, flat fields can still be imported using solar is the best way. Uh, very easy. Uh, the mods was kind of a mods row type plugin. It's a little bit of a misnomer. It's actually a generic XML slash XPath plugin. And here's some, a snippet from a YML file for importing something out of a DDI. This row type, uh, I didn't actually define a row type called DDI, but if you use any stream that isn't solar or whatever, uh, that for which there's a pre-existing plugin, uh, it will just default to the mods plugin, which lets you specify an XPath expression to reach into your XML data to get uh, the base part of the element that you want. Then you can specify, if you wanted to sort of get a multiple sub-elements out of a parent element, you could, instead of just that period, you could add extra parts onto the end of your XPath. As well, your destination, if you are putting something into a paragraph, there's a plugin called Entity Reference Revision. This is quite simple. And the one thing to kind of know about this is uh, that there's a kind of a lookup migration. When you uh, put something into a paragraph and then you need to attach it to a node, and in our case for an identifier, we formed an identifier out of the PID and also the name, uh, in this case, the uh, person name. And this gives a unique uh, entry in the migrate lookup table, because otherwise the, a bunch of these would have the same PID. So you have to kind of make a little more complicated identifier. And when you are attaching this to the paragraph, the thing to be careful of is there's a lot of outdated obsolete information about migrating paragraphs. And the current way is quite simple. And if you look at the unhighlighted text, it's just repeating the same thing. You just need to use uh, have this double field with subprocess. All subprocesses is uh, run a migration kind of inside of a migration to attach these two attributes to one value, the ID and the revision ID, which is important because paragraphs, like I said, are revision locked. This here is the end result. This is our, our new RDM system based on Drupal 8 and Islandor 8. We're using a custom content type. Uh, we're not using Islandor objects. We similarly, like, you know, all of our metadata and forms, we want to be specifically useful to our end user, and most of that uh, does not share metadata with uh, Islandor objects. Here's a little more, here are the data streams. Those are normally not published. Uh, this is just kind of an administrative view of legacy imported content. And here is some of the subjects that were imported and some of the names. So I'm just gonna quickly check my time. This seems to have done not too badly. This is the last section. If we have time, I will cover this. Here's some tips and tricks for developers. If you're finding migrations a little bit opaque and intimidating, I certainly did at first. Uh, you don't want to put passwords in your YML files. There was a trick that Danny did for the Migrate 7x Claw where there was a config screen that only affected the migrations that shipped with Migrate 7x Claw, but there's a hook you can implement to include your own migrations to update the Fedora username and password and uh, server address. Just kind of follow this pattern, uh, implement Migrate 7x Claw settings form submit and uh, look up the form submit code in migrate 7 claw and copy that. I suggest, and I would maybe put in a future request, that we can make this a little more end user friendly. So that would be really helpful because definitely don't want to be storing your passwords in YML files. Uh, also, devel migrate, really, really helpful. It tells you exactly what's going on between the migrate steps. Uh, you really want to use that. And one more thing, very useful migrate plugin is called callback. And what that does is it just runs any PHP function you want that takes a parameter. It will send the current migration uh, string to it. And I use that a lot with Vardom. And in here, uh, I just kind of needed to insert this into the files migration uh, just before the MIME type lookup step because we had some bad data that had MIME types that had capital letters in them. And that was causing migration to fail because the lookup failed. So I just inserted this before the mime type lookup in the Alador 7x files plugin. Um, and all that does is calls the PHP function str to lower on the um, mime type. So that's the end. Uh, if you want to look at some of this stuff, 
the homepage for the RDM project is here, islanderrdm.resourcebases.ca. And you can run an Ansible playbook to set up a blank, empty research data management platform based on Islander 8. And there's, if you want to just look at the custom code we made, that's also on Rob Lou's GitHub, islander-rdm. And you can follow me on Twitter, ALXP, and email me, aoneal at upei.ca. So that's it for me.